Kaczynski for all their support and hard work during the preparation process. At these events, 22 professors from the USA and Argentina will discuss and call into question the connections, intersections, and point of contact between concepts such as ethnicity, class, feminism, testimonial literature, translation, decolonial turn and language teaching, geopolitics, history, and memory. These gatherings are all about engaging in dialogue, or as Rita de Segato puts it, thinking in conversation, a way of approaching these issues that is both fitting and lucid. At today's session, we'll hear from Dr. Erika Edwards. Thank you very much, Erika and Jorge as well. But before that, before that, Professor Cecilia Chiaccio from the University of La Plata and the Assistant Cultural Affair of the US Embassy in Argentina, Michael McLean, will say a few words of welcome. Cecilia Chiaccio is a member of the Board of Directors of the School of Humanities and Educational Science at the National University of La Plata. She's also professor of American literature and English literature in, at the university. Between 2010 and 2018, she was head of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. She is also a researcher at the Center for Literature and Comparative Literature at the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, which is part of the National University of La Plata. She has presented papers at conferences and published in academic journals on literatures and feminisms. She has acted as a reviewer for various journals and was the editor of the review section of Gender and Language from 2013 to 2018. In 1995, she was awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities grant from the US Embassy and received a Fulbright study at the US Institute's scholarship in 2000. Michael McLean is a third tour public diplomacy officer. His first tour was in Mexico City and he most recently completed a tour in Kabul, both of which were in the consular section. He began his career with the State Department in the civil service as a staff assistant in the front office for the Bureau of International Information Programs. While working for IIP, Mr. McLean also completed a three-month TDY as the acting public affairs officer in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea. Originally from upstate New York, he holds a BA in international relations MS in public relations and MA in international relations, all from Syracuse University. He's a Rotary Youth Exchange and Boring Fellowships alumnus, both to Brazil. Now we'll hear Ceci. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, everyone. Uh, well, good afternoon. My name is Anna Seri Cecilia Chiaccio. I teach uh, literature in the United States, and I'm also um, professor representative of the school's council. But I'm also a Fulbrighter. I mean, as Anna uh, told you, uh, long ago, I was awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities by the US Embassy and um, a grant by the Fulbright Commission to attend intensive seminars on American culture and literature. So I know firsthand how relevant, how important these seminars are for our careers. Today's talk opens a series of lectures which engage in important issues for both Argentina and the United States. Shared dialogues about gender, race, geopolitics, history and memory. There are five seminars in total. The one which opens today, a second one at the end of May, and three more in September, October, and November. The first cycle or seminar consists of three lectures in charge of Professors Edwards, Troisi, and Raimundo, who discuss ethnicity and class in Argentina and in the United States. Racial identities, class identities, 
policies, history, historical representation. These are just some of the category, categories that are unfolded and examined from a perspective that makes clear that categories overlap and get more and more complex and that history is far from being limited to an archive in a traditional sense. It is relevant that these lectures are developed by scholars from both countries and from different universities and academic cultures. Professor Edwards from the University of North Carolina and Professors Troisi and Raimundo from Facultad de Humanidades from the University of La Plata. This speaks of academic bonds, both previous and reinforced by this project. Academic bonds and dialogue. And this is in part the richness of these seminars Conversation as a methodology implies listening, expressing ideas, questioning, looking for answers, rethinking, sharing and constructing together. It is collaborative work. But apart from these bonds between scholars and institutions, I have no doubt that the lectures will also encourage the audience to ask questions, to revise concepts and to engage in new discussions. This ambitious project then, is it is about situated experiences, but experiences that are also liable to be compared, contrasted, and which nurture one another. A project fostering exchanges, fostering critical thinking, self-reflection and debate, and thus fostering transformation, the opportunity for rethinking education, politics, society, and ourselves from perspectives that are intersectional, comparative, interdisciplinary, situated, and transregional. Uh, I'd like one, uh, I, I add to what Anna said, and I'd like to thank the Embassy of the United States and Facultad de Humanidades for giving us scholars, students, and public in general, the opportunity of these conversations. Thank you. So now it's time, time for um, Mike McLean. Yeah. Hi there, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Mike McLean. I'm the Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer at the U.S. Embassy here in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Um, and we are very excited to be sponsoring this virtual program um, as it is a hallmark of the uh, Biden administration's priorities on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. These are priorities that the administration shares um, across government and here at the embassy, um, Ambassador Stanley and all of us are very um, uh, proud to be supporting and very excited that this, um, this lecture series will be um, uh, contributing to, to those goals. Um, and uh, a big congratulations to the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the National University of La Plata, especially to Ana Principi and her team for all the hard work implementing this program. Um, I know that it's no small task. Um, our, our processes in the embassy are, are very bureaucratic and long, and we appreciate you uh, 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 going through that with us. And um, it shows great results that we're able to have such great faculty um, from both Argentina and the United States participating in this program. Um, Dr. Jorge Trocisi and um, Dr. Marcelo uh, Ramundo, um, thank you so much for your participation as well. And a special thank you to Dr. Cecilia Chiacho for being here today. Um, it's fantastic to hear that you're a Fulbrighter. Um, it's a program that we uh, obviously support and is part of uh, the U.S. government's um, uh, effort to increase people-to-people -people exchanges. Um, and you are a prime example of, of uh, Fulbrighter uh, continuing on the mission um, that you, you uh, uh, started with your program. Um, uh, the, uh, with the National Endowment uh, for the Arts. Um, and it's also very impressive that uh, you, you uh, are putting on this, this series of conferences and seminars uh, with both Argentine and US academics um, on, on uh, shared research and, and views throughout the year. Um, it's, it's one thing to do a one-off event, but to do a series of events is, is impressive and, and we thank you for, for all of that effort. The ideas and conversations we will share um, will contribute to the increased mutual understanding between our two countries. Um, and, and that's very that's something that's very exciting. And we're able to reach so many people through uh, through the virtual uh, modality. Um, we will 
eventually be back to in person um, and we are slowly getting there, but we're still in that transition space. So thank you all for participating um, in this conferences, both um, the, the faculty as well as uh, the students that will, are connecting from across Argentina and the United States. Um, Welcome to uh, all the speakers, as I said, from the National University of La Plata and from the United States. And a special thank you to the University of North Carolina and our presenter, Dr. Erica Edwards, our first presenter, Dr. Erica Edwards. Um, I think the, one of the things in the embassy we um, are, are proud of is the faculty uh, to faculty exchanges, which we really know are what helps uh, universities uh, from, from different countries connect and keep those connections going. Um, and uh, the, the students as well, um, will your participation and your interest in, the, in these conversations are crucial and will enrich the exchange of ideas uh, throughout these sessions. So with that, um, uh, thank you to all. And I, I really hope that all these lectures will be fruitful and everybody will be able to have um, deep and meaningful conversations about these very important issues. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning for me here. Uh, it's an honor to present uh, Dr. Erica Edwards. Uh, Dr. Edwards got his PhD in Atlantic history from FIU, Florida International University. She's professor at University, university of uh, North Carolina at Charlotte. And particularly, she wrote a uh, her great book, uh, Hiding in Plain Sight. That book won the best black history book in 2020. Uh, uh, that book also won the Leticia Woods Brown Memorial Book Prize. Uh, she had recognition for student mentorship and teaching. Uh, that's for, for Erica. Uh, her blog on global urban history was the most read in 2021. And also her book was finalist for the Harry Truman Book Prize Award and the Western Association of Women's Historians. Um, but uh, I'm glad to be here to present Erica because she's my friend. Uh, I'm so, so proud of that. Uh, she's a very nice person. And uh, she was already at our university uh, giving a talk pre uh, presenting her book uh, before the pandemic. And I don't know if you know it, Erica, but your talk, virtual talk in 2020, was the first one in our university during the pandemic days. So uh, it was great to, to have you at that time. It was a kind of relief uh, during the worst time of pandemic and quarantine in our country. So we all appreciate uh, that you were always eager to help us and to be with us. Thank you again. And this is your time, Erica. Do it. <laughs> You would think after a few years of being on Zoom, I'd remember to turn off or on the mute button, but still it gets us all, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you, uh, Jorge. Thank you, the Univer National University of La Plata and the US Embassy um, for this opportunity to engage um, two countries, different time zones, um, people from hopefully all over the world, uh, but really being a part of a dialogue that I think is necessary. And hopefully this will just be the beginnings of what else the, you know, uh, the, the embassy can do in the future. This is a great idea. So um, thank you. Um, with that, I will go ahead and jump into my PowerPoint. So please be patient there. Okay, we should be all set then. 
All right, so today, okay, great, thank you. <laughs> so today I will be presenting a talk on the whitening process in Argentina, understanding the racialization, or excuse me, racial identities and the racialization process during the 19th century. Um, ultimately, what I hope this talk will provide is a springboard to further discussions of how, in many ways, race is defined, characterized, and or often stereotyped uh, racialized ultimately today in Argentina. Um, and so with that, I will jump into the, let's go here. Here we go. So very briefly, what I'd like to provide is a timeline of essentially what will be the bulk of my talk, a talk that is ultimately based off of um, my book, but um, a, the larger scope of my um, my research over the past 20 years. So ultimately, what I like to do is define whitening, the whitening process, um, mainly in the 19th century, but it's important, of course, to acknowledge the colonial period. Me being a colonialist, that's usually where I begin. Um, and one of the things I really want to stress about the colonial period is it's ability to really define in some way, shape, or form racial identities and kind of take that at the point of the foundations of these racial identities. If we think about what we mean by whiteness, by blackness, by indigeneity, or the, uh, the, the label as I will refer to as India or India, because I'm referencing specifically the colonial period. Um, what is important to stress about that is that you have then these three foundations, um, basically miscegenation, marriage, and manumission. And what I think really helps to put this together is if we keep those ideas and processes in mind, we can see how already Argentina, of course, fits within the larger imperial project of the Spanish Indies, or excuse me, of the Spanish empire, and particularly how it fits within the Spanish Indies. In other words, what I hope to also disrupt through this conversation is this notion of Argentina being an exceptional um, experience when it comes to racial formation and or racial identities. So if we think of miscegenation right off the bat in terms of um, how we're going to look at and understand racial identities, miscegenation is clearly one of the, the most, the newest in quotation calidad that will come forward is mestizo. So before I even get into mestizo, I want to make sure we understand calidad is ultimately a, what some would reference as being a racial ideology, but it's important for us to keep in mind that calidad or quality, if we were to say it in English, provides for kind of a mixing and melding and fluidity of a persona. And in particular, an individual and how they are defined, but not defined in terms of how they want to project themselves, but rather how they want themselves to be viewed by others, because it's the others, right, that define who you are, especially in the colonial period. This is not the, you know, 21st century of self-care and who I want to be and how I want to produce myself, and this is how I'm going to project, but rather it is who you are is constantly defined by others. So if we keep that in mind in terms of calidad and in terms of then defining specifically whiteness, blackness, and indigeneity, what we find is a new one, mestizo, as I was mentioning, coming forward because of miscegenation. So first and foremost, if we think about whiteness and ultimately what is defined as being Spanish identity, what we know is that that represents Represents in many ways status and privilege. And I like to keep with the notion of NIST because again, because of Calidad and the way that it is performed and or produced over time, there's constantly a evolution to it. It is it's not a permanent um, identity. Instead, it's something that we have to constantly acknowledge that it will ebb and flow based off of what, what the circumstances are, specifically the social and the cultural aspects of it. So we have this notion of being a level of privilege, the highest status, 
Um, this is in terms of whiteness. We see also within the colonial documentation, they are known as and defined as Espanol or Espanola. They're often uh, noted with the honorific um, title of Don or Dona. And they are always considered to be, um, to have, excuse me, limpieza de sangre and be Catholic. And they are ultimately what represents the crown as well as the church. And then we have notions of what it means to be indigenous and being Indian and specific, specifically, and that in many ways can be a antithesis to this notion of whiteness, and especially during the years of conquest. And so there's a justification for the ability to ultimately conquer, take over, kill, whatever it takes to ultimately annex, I'll stress, and or steal various parts of various territory throughout the Americas. Argentina is not unique as, as well in, in that regard. So you have that, and but they ultimately are representing as they do throughout the Americas, the original peoples, and of course had their own culture, language, and ways of life that are now being forced to ultimately submit to, in some way, shape, or form, to these notions of civilization or, or Spanish whiteness, or be rejected and be always considered that level of, in quotation, barbarism or um, savagery, they would define it as. Then the third one we have is blackness. And blackness, again, these are the primary ones for the colonization process, process and the foundations of racial identities, ultimately will be equated to being enslaved. There is over time, um, especially by the late 16th century, early 17th century, and this is roughly when Argentina now is, excuse me, what the Rio de la Plata now is coming to being. It's late, if we were to say it nicely, it's late in comparison to other parts of the Americas in terms of colonization. So getting within um, that process, the majority of Africans and African descendants will be coming to Argentina as enslaved peoples. Very few are free. They would be mainly part of the original uh, conquest um, raids that went into Argentina, but very few. Um, so with that being said, you have this new label of mestizo that will come forward that will ultimately readjust our understanding in terms of racial identities, right? You have those that are white that are considered to be the privileged, indigenous peoples that have one of two options, either submit and become quote unquote civilized, living in encomiendas and pueblos, uh, they tributarios over time, or being enslaved, i.e. black, and then you have, of course, this mixture, miscegenation, that creates a mestizo. And what we find right away is that despite this notion of Spanish, excuse me, domination or attempts to dominate, those that are not considered Spanish are constantly fighting against that. And they will find ways in order to, to um, ultimately obtain levels of social mobility that are initially denied to them. So I say this all because once Mestizo comes forward, what we see right away is their ability to um, <clears throat> socially advance. And what I mean by that is that, especially for the first generation in Argentina, the Spanish fathers and indigenous mothers that I'm referring to, uh, their, their daughters, Mestiza daughters, oftentimes had the ability to socially advance and obtain levels of whiteness because their Spanish fathers oftentimes acknowledge them. And so already we're seeing the cracks of whiteness opening up in terms of it not being as solidified as other people have thought. And instead whiteness then because of it being a calidad allows for this ebb flow of certain people with different qualities um, to ultimately become a part of that. And that's important that we consider that when we think about Argentina and the way that whiteness is even defined today. Hold that thought, I'll get there later. Um, then the idea of marriage and what that means for us in terms of um, miscegenate, excuse me, racial mixture 
in that what makes Argent, well, all of Spanish America quite unique to the, to the United States is that the church acknowledged intermarriages, although rare, they were off, they did take place. And so we have in the 16th century and the 17th century marriages between um, black women, sometimes enslaved and um, white men, or we still have indigenous women with white men. And it's, again, that protection from the church that allows for social assent. And considering, especially at the beginning of the 16th century, where it's still very early on in conquest um, and colonization, we still see that their children in many ways, so I'd say the first generation, possibly the second generation, are able to, again, make that jump to whiteness. And then lastly, during this colonization process, and this is important for us to consider, is the freedom process, manumission, what that ultimately allows for, especially those that are enslaved, to ultimately obtain. And I say this because we need to divorce ourselves from thinking that ultimately those that come over to the Americas are forever damned. We need to really look at individual, or as much as we need to, to be as in, in, we need to be as individualized as possible. Sorry, when it comes to thinking about enslaved experiences, they are not homogeneic, and especially when you think about Argentina and how unique that is, and let's say its northern neighbors, Brazil, and what you have an economy that is not and I stress not based off of slave labor, um, but rather slavery becomes over time a status symbol, right, for the very elite. Um, and of course, um, an uh, uh, it generates a good, strong economy for the church. Um, as Jorge's work has shown, Jesuits especially um, in the interior, they are the ones that own the majority of slaves. And so, I say this because then we have to also acknowledge that there is constantly ways in which they found to manumit themselves, i.e. free themselves or free their families. And that was happening from the very beginning of colonization. And so I put this out there to kind of already give us a sense that by the 19th century, calidad is constantly in flux, whiteness is constantly in flux, blackness, as well as indigeneity as well, constantly are in flux. So to obtain whiteness is not as difficult as some would claim um, or think because there's so many factors to calidad. It's not just phenotype. And going through these levels of mixture, whether it be um, an informal or former um, unions allows for us to again, see Argentina within a larger framework of the Spanish Indies and ultimately, again, dismiss this uniqueness about Argentina. Oops, let me go back. So skipping ahead um, so, uh, to the end of the 18th century then, what we're gonna see with the Spanish crown is the Bourbon reforms. And what's important for us too, and I'm just gonna give a very brief overview of that because that we're gonna really get into this, is to recognize that at this moment in time, at the end of the 18th century, this is the end of the colonial period, there is a, there's a call and a need, I would argue in many ways for the crown to reassert its authority. It's now during the age of revolution, this thing called the United States has been created, this thing called Haiti has been created, and all of this is coming together so that the Spanish crown is now, um, let's say, under a lot of pressure to potentially reassert its authority and, of course, regain or at least generate revenue. And so levels of surveillance are going to come forward that will really then start to think about what and how we define peoples and where and how they can get about in their lives. Laws such as sumptuary laws, marriage, which until you know about this point had always been somewhat protected by the church in terms of free will, but now will become under attack under the marriage or under the Bourbon reforms. Vagrancy will also take hold as a new issue as well. And ultimately, 
These bourbon reforms, and specifically um, they're in some places known as the edicts of good governance, will ultimately look to, um, to categorize and count the people and really see what is happening within Argentina. <clears throat> this, of course, again, is Argentina as well as Mexico or any other place throughout the, um, the Spanish Indies at this point. The crown wants to know who are its people and how I can get access to more monies. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then finally, as an overview, is the, the Republican period. And that's where I'm going to spend most of the time in terms of thinking of from 1810 roughly to um, 1861, citizenship and belonging, and what that means in terms of racial identity. Now that we are starting to break away from a Spanish past and create, in quotation, a new beginning and a new future, what does this republic or how can this republic be defined? And in that specific moment, I will be focusing primarily on my area of expertise, which is Cordoba. And I stress this because there's so many different republics at this time that we oftentimes forget that it's not just Buenos Aires. I wanna show why I focused on, on, on Cordoba and its uniqueness. And then lastly, I'll speak briefly about the national period, which is roughly the 1861 to the early 20th century. And that is a moment of modernization or homogeneity in which whiteness is completely solidified. So with that, let's get down to the fun stuff, <laughs> which is me in the archive. And I too was a fellow Fulbright many, 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 many years ago. Um, and here I am doing the work that is ultimately going to be my dissertation. And this is the archive in Cordoba, or the provincial archive. It's old location, it's no longer there. But I put this out there because clearly I think it's important for people to know who I am and why. Why would I even do something like this? What is, what is going on? Um, my first trip to Argentina was 2002. And um, as a study abroad, and one of the first things I noticed was that there were no black people in Argentina, at least none that I could define as being black by US standards. And it shocked me. It took me a few weeks to really get used to it. <laughs> I knew absolutely nothing about the country before I came. Um, and so it really kind of shocked me to, to learn um, that there was such a common saying, which was, no hay negros, there are no black people, you know? And when I would ask, well, well what happened? How did that happen? Why would that happen? Um, most would just say they disappeared. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, here I am now, what, 20 something years old, that doesn't happen. So what is the reason behind that? What is going on that would allow for people to so casually mention that these people have disappeared? And so um, after doing some digging, I realized I was going to go on to grad school, come back with the Fulbright, which is, I'm doing that there, um, 2008, 2009, and, and get to work and discover something that I thought was quite interesting. Because what I realized too, is that I can be, and I have a very unique position as uh, being uh, professionally involved in this, as well as personally involved. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, after the last 20 years or so of um, doing research, I realized um, being a Black woman from the United States in Argentina gives me a very unique perspective because I could see the results of why saying no hay negros was in many ways uh, problematic because <laughs> you know, here I am walking the streets and I know of other black immigrants that have actually made Argentina their home and to con constantly say that there aren't any, it just continues to perpetuate this notion that there, that there never was, right? And, or that we're ignoring them and continuing to ignore them. And so um, it just continued to propel me to, to do the work. And I really was impressed with the notion of, um, 
going back to the colonial period as I gave you the timeline to begin uh, that process. Lastly, what I wanna say about my timeline, or excuse me, about my time in Argentina is um, I think what really was impressive was that realizing that in many ways people were uncomfortable with calling me Negra, but had no problem referring to him <laughs> and people like him as Negro. And actually that's interesting. So, you know, I'd get in debates with people and I would say, you know, you can call me Negra. No, 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 no. You are not Mulat, you are Morad, Morocha, you are Mulata, you are something else. And I'd say, okay. But then refer to those Negros as people that look like Diego Marlana. And I keep thinking to myself, what is up with this racialization process? How does that work? May he rest in peace, of course. How is that possible when he died that a friend of mine, you know, was talking to me very informally and told me, you know, he was our Malcolm X. Now, for someone from the United States, Malcolm X means possibly something different. Um, one in which I wouldn't use that, that label so freely, but I was interested. So I told her, do tell, please explain to me how this works that um, he can be your Malcolm X. And they went on to explain ultimately that he represented the people from the barrio. He represented someone who could climb from the very bottom and rise to the national level and represent a country that for many of us is very white, but we aren't. And that struck me, not only for the fact that he, he can be referred to as, you know, being kind of this hero for los, los negros, but that there's an acknowledgement then that the whiteness, as I mentioned in the timeline, continues to be very flexible. So what attributes or ways in which Diego Maradona can adopt whiteness, become the national emblem of Argentina, but then still there's a level of consciousness that he's not white, right? Obviously his, his talent is what propelled him to another level. And I say this because someone else who is, you know, Diego Maradona, who is working a regular job, probably does does not have that ability to transcend that national level and become quote unquote white in Argentina. So here it was 2014, where I finally said, it's my time, I guess I, I gotta do something. Here is the World Cup. And ultimately what is taking place, it, oh, this is a picture. And, it, and, and when, he, when they made it to the finals, um, Blogs just lit up everywhere. And the question then came forward from so many people, um, prominent scholars that were constantly asking, okay, how is it possible that this team does not have one black player? How is this possible? Every other South American team has a black player. Even Germany that's in the final has a black player. So where and why doesn't Argentina have that? Well, by 2014, I'm busy finishing my dissertation, converting it to a book, a book that I'll talk about in a little bit, but it had a different focus. It was more on the legal understandings of race in Cordoba. And I stopped because I was just fascinated by the fact that people didn't know. Like I had done the work, there's plenty of brilliant Argentine scholars that have done the work. Why haven't people read Why? Why is there such a disconnect with the academy and the people? That's what I could not comprehend. I truly had to think about that. And in the end, what I decided to do then was to provide a book, the book that I eventually published, that would actually deal with the roots of this uh, question of whiteness and the whitening process in particular. Because again, 
looking at these people, you can probably see this number 20, number one, would not, at least in my eyes, define themselves physically or could not physically meet the standards of being white, which I would see more number, I believe it's 15 or number four or number 10, right? So how are they able to move beyond levels of clearly what is their darker skin, which in other countries, maybe they would be defined as being mestizo. Um, definitely in the United States, he they would not be defined as being white. How are they able to make that move? And again, cracks, cracks that we saw as early in the colonial period when they discussed the levels of the timeline, cracks of whiteness are still, cons or cracks in the notions of whiteness are still relevant today. So what I did, and um, as we start to get in, as I call the meat and potatoes of the talk, is I wanted to kind of get into how these cracks take place. And what are the ways in which specifically women played a role in those, making those cracks, making those um, spaces, social mobility, as they, we may argue today, how are they able to do that? Well, first I must explain why I chose women and what, why that's so significant. One, what I realized again, because I'm responsible and wanted to engage in my Argentine, in the Argentine scholarship, is that uh, the majority of it is on men. That's okay. They're there. We should study them, of course. But what I think was missing then is where is she? Because the myths that constantly I hear, and many of you I'm sure as I'm going through the, or thinking about them are that she had no choice because all black men died in the wars of independence. I mean, pull out the, the fricking violin. It's so annoying sometimes to hear such inaccuracies, right? But ultimately they paint her as a victim. And I, as a black woman, don't know too many like that. And so I said, mm, no, I think there's a history here and it's one that deserves to be truly engaged and truly a part of this whitening process. So I chose her and I chose her also because I, what I wanted to do was then to focus on where I could find her and also bring that into fruition because unlike Black men who are in more public, um, public facing roles. And so we're finding them more, for example, in the armies and or in the cofradillas, the cabildos. Um, she, where I had to find her was where she was at, which was in the domestic sphere. So it was to shift the conversation to the private sphere to really engage who she was and how she went about ultimately protecting herself and propelling and protecting her family. Because that's what I think made her unique. It was not the loud and public facing movements of various levels of resistance. It was for her a quiet fortitude and one which was in many ways very sacrificial. And she did all and that she had to in order to protect her family. And so I thought that was quite a unique experience as I delved into her, pro her participation in the whitening process. I also wanna draw attention, because I'm sure everyone's like, well, what's this in the background? Argentina land of vanishing blacks. This is the cover of an article that was written in 1973 by Ebony, magazine. Ebony Magazine is a magazine that is geared towards the Black population in, our, um, in the United States. This is 1973. This was the first writings, at least within English, that we have published um, in the United States about Argentina's quote-unquote land of vanishing Blacks. It will follow a few years later with Reed Andrews' book, but I also want to give credit to um, Emiliano Indrick's book in the 1960s that really put forward this question of, again, what is happening in terms of racial identities. Since the 1980s, um, 
Argentine scholars have really uh, moved forward with Black history and really are we're beginning, or they're beginning, I would say, many ways to develop a field of Black history. And this especially has exploded over the last 20 years. And I pause to always give credit where credit is due because I don't think enough people realize how much work is out there. It's just a matter of um, people getting having access to the great Argentine scholarship that has been published over the years. So with that, as I was mentioning before, as I get back to the Black, Black women and, and, and why them, I then went ahead and said, if I'm going to find them within the domestic sphere, a sphere in which ultimately represents in many ways um, the uh, microcosms of larger society, right? The household should be politicized. It should be a place of social, economic, political, and emotional relationships that help to define our movement, or not our movement, but their movement towards the whitening process. Keeping in mind, as my timeline put forward, there always this notion of a Spanish identity represented the ultimate level or the apex of a social hierarchical scale. So the movement toward that for many was not just a haphazard decision, it was one for many that was the only decision and one worth making in order to propel themselves and or their families. And I say this because sometimes we're thinking, well, did they sell out? No, they didn't. They did what I think any other mother would do, which was to make sure that their child had a better life for themselves. Lastly, is Cordoba, as I mentioned, that will be the bulk of what I want to talk about and why as a case study for the whitening process in Argentina. And in particular, Cordoba serves then as one, an antithesis to Buenos Aires. And I specifically chose to do that because 99.9% .9 of all Black studies are about Buenos Aires. But as I want to stress, Argentina is a big country. And so if Argentina is a big country, so are Black experiences. And so in order to move beyond a homogeneic notion of what is um, Black, we need to, and I, I encourage others, to go to other parts of the country in order for us to continue to enhance and build on the Black studies of Argentina. So Cordoba. Not only being an antithesis to Buenos Aires, what does that mean by being an antithesis to Buenos Aires? It means it is traditional, it is conservative, it's small, and it is very much in bed with the Catholic Church. Location-wise, it always connected the coast throughout the colonial period, either a stopping point for slaves and or a, um, excuse me, or a stopping point for, for the silver that was flowing back to Buenos Aires on its way to, to Spain. It was such a central location and it was very much bedded with the colonial economy. But because it remained a very small city, for me as a researcher, that was the advantage. Because as I took the various census data that was available throughout the time period that I studied, I was able to trace Black women who were born Black, but were dying Donas. It was because it was such a small city, I could find her buying property, buying slaves, moving to different parts of the city, be engaged in levels of, of uh, um, lawsuits and constantly see in many ways, shape or form how she was able to, uh, social, to move up the social hierarchical scale. And so Cordoba, like I mentioned, then really was, a, a, I would say, godsend for me as a researcher to be able to get in there and to find so much stuff. And so shout out to the archivist as well, because very immaculate condition as well. And so because it's Cordoba, because it's Black women, because I wanted to ultimately look into the politicalization of the household, I had to find out 
you know, where they lived, loved, labored, and specifically who these women were. They were the concubines, they were the wives, they were the mothers, and they were the daughters. And as I go through each of these roles, I want to also provide a larger context then into this actual whitening process. Keeping in mind, again, that the cracks in whiteness is what ultimately, I would argue, continues to perpetuate it. Because although there is this image of Argentine, Argentina being a European white nation, the reality is, is the majority of them are, I would say, in the othering, othering excuse me, label that we'll talk about. And that is what continues to keep the notions of whiteness safe. So let's get into this. And specifically, if we were to refer back to the timeline, um, I will go ahead and uh, the timeline being the end of the 18th century and the Bourbon reforms. Some of the things that I want talked about were specifically how Calidad was still in flux. And more specifically, the ways in which the crown, and if we look at, on the ground in Cordoba, the edicts of good governance came into being under Sobremonte in order to ultimately reestablish order and to essentially deal with the fact that after they had taken the census, Spanish population realized or felt they were under siege because the majority of people in the city were not labeled Spanish. So how do we curb that and reestablish whiteness for the select few versus the majority that have been able to take advantage of, of the cracks? Um, <clears throat> some of the things that I found then, or as I mentioned, if we think about the roles of women and concubines. One particular case study was this woman named Bernabella Vichamante, who was able to go from a slave to a senora over the course of her lifetime. And this again is a situation in which it isn't just her working as an individual, but it's because of her lover who was a priest that allowed for this to take place. And so Bernabella Villamonte was encouraged to dress like a Spanish woman, was encouraged to ultimately put on the persona of a senora. But again, the issue was that her husband, or excuse me, her lover was a priest. What was the threatening aspect about her is that because of these many years of, of miscegenation that we had spoken about earlier, she was now as um, and constantly labeled the color of a Spanish woman. And so thinking in terms of the performative notion of what race can do at the end of the 18th century, where it's still quite fluid, true in quotations, um, doñas were quite threatened by her. And so they would constantly say in the court case that they were um, insulted by the fact that this slave would dare to wear pearls, for example, or silk, for example, and all that they could even be more ashamed about, not even ashamed about, but aghast about was the fact that this priest encouraged it. And so they said, how dare he cause a scandal? And so we also have to look at then in terms of those that are able to assess and, and, and access, excuse me, whiteness, how are, the, how are others able to assist that, that process? What are the ways in which you can see that in her case, it was her lover who encouraged this. And I mean, some of the stuff is, it could be a telenovela when you think about it. He, you know, dressed her in clothes that were forbidden these sumptuary laws that had come out to basically reestablish social, social hierarchy, saying that mulatas cannot wear certain types of jewelry or silk. He would put her specifically in there. He demanded that other slaves, slaves that she was initially in, um, with, ultimately um, call her senora. And she, of course, was able to take advantage of this. 
I say this because it's also during this moment at the end of the 19th, 18th century that we have these vagrancy laws that are coming forth and also to curb levels of moral ignorance and illicit activity, they would then ultimately target these black men usually or anyone on the street that they found to be a problem, ask them for their labor papers, right? In which they would say their name and what they are doing. If they didn't have that, they were conscripted into the militia. And so there's this attempt to really, um, to, to stop levels of physical mobility as well as social mobility in order to reestablish the crown during the age of revolution. Now, ultimately, this story unfortunately ends with him um, being um, rejected from the church he ends up going or being um, sent to La Plata, to De Sucre in Bolivia, and he dies a year later. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we're not sure. Or I'm not sure what exactly happens to Bernabella. Um, and I think that is the issue of concubines is that they're constantly in a precarious situation. But her ability to climb and become that senora ultimately, again, shows the whiteness process that is happening. Of course, marriage was and still remained an option. However, by the end of the 19th century, what we're finding is that the crown also attempted to curb those inter intermarriages that I spoke about earlier in the talk. Those few and rare <laughs> intermarriages that took place um, I believe Tichina Ferreira noted that over 25, just 25 over the course of the 18th century, over 100 plus years took place, but that was too much. That was too much for the crown. And in fact, by then, so Monte also by the early 19th century was writing the crown to say that this is um, when he was the uh, viceroy of um, Buenos Aires is also noting Buenos Aires had too many inter intermarriages as well. Um, too many, I don't know, what, what, 10 or 15, whatever, but it was too many for them, that they came up with this interesting law called the, the, the Royal Pragmatic of 1776 that was transferred to the Indies. And it ultimately was meant to curb unequal marriages. And in doing so, what it ultimately showed was throughout the Americas, or excuse me, throughout Spanish America, um, these were oftentimes pinned towards those that were considered to um, be against people of mala sangre, meaning of African descent. So that is what we also find in Argentina. The law ultimately said that if you are younger than 25, you had to get your parents' permission to marry. And then after that, um, if they said no, however, you had the right to um, appeal. And so what I have, luckily, what we all have as historians are these appeals known as marriage descent cases. And in the case of Cordoba, they're just as juicy as I mentioned as any other telenovela. And again, it really stressed and showed what or how Cordoba, Cordoba is viewed an ideal wife. And so what I found was ultimately for women that were accused of having mala sangre, uh, meaning of African descent, um, in general, then they would go through the process of, of having these marriage descent cases. And they would, um, I found out 52% of the time, the civil judge, because it was no longer in the hands of the church, the civil judge would um, say yes. Actually, I do not agree with the parents and the children are allowed to marry, right? 48% of the times, however, they upheld um, the, um, the parents' decision. So what I decided to do was I looked specifically then at, that's not that much of a difference. So I went back into the arguments to really understand then, well, what did the 52% do to edge it out? And I found out these women would claim that they were, uh, it was a case of mistaken identity. And instead, that they truly were a woman of 
their class in terms of their white fiancés. And it worked. So not surprised when I read about these women claiming to be um, and did, uh, excuse me, being white or Española. That was not a shocker. What shocked me was how many cases I found in which they claimed to be indigenous. And so that was interesting to think about where then this indigenous identity was coming in as late as the, as the um, 18th century, early 19th century, in terms of defining the um, racial, racial identities. Indigenous identity, as I mentioned before, throughout the colonial period had either one or one or two options in many ways, right? Choose this level of civilization, quote unquote, you know, due to mes mestizaje and, um, excuse me, miscegenation, for some mestizos, they were able to ascend to whiteness, ultimately rejecting their indigenous past. But others, as the crown appeared to hold in somewhat of a special, um, a special uh, status, a unique status, one in which that same law acknowledged that they were, some were distinguished Spaniards based off of their nobility. And so that's what I find in Argentina as well. In this case, oh, Manuela Arieta did just that. She argued in order to marry her um, fiance, that it was a case of mistaken identity. She was not black. She was in fact a descendant of noble Indians and would point to the fact that her family came from families of, excuse me, that her, I believe her, was it her, her father, not her father, but her grandfather was a cacique, that they had been from the Pampas, that they were evangelized, good Christians, honorable peoples, anything to show levels of nobility. And it, again, it worked. And so it also gave me a sense of what type of indigenous person, in quotation, was acceptable at the end of the 19th century in Cordoba. And that was one, of course, of class who was obviously a, a higher class. He was obviously Christianized and who also played a very important role in terms of siding with and are being somewhat closer to whiteness than clearly blackness. Those were the ideal wives and thus those that claimed that they had either um, Spanish or indigenous um, identities and thus it was a mistaken identity. Those are the ones that were allowed in these marriage descent cases to marry. Again, showing the cracks of whiteness. So then we get into the Republican period that I spoke about very briefly, one in which citizenship will become paramount. And one of the, before we get into that, one of the main things, however, that defined citizenship for the Re Republican period was freedom. And in particular, this freedom transcended not just um, this little, this, this, this removal from Spanish control, but it also meant something about the um, enslaved peoples and one in which they had to ultimately throughout all the Americas had to deal with this hypocrisy of having enslaved peoples while freeing themselves from these tyrants known as the Spanish. And so what we start to see again, when we think about the Republican period are, and, and this is what I found so interesting, the role of mothers and how that engendered the freedom process. And in doing so, what we find, because it's Cordoba, is that unlike the in Buenos Aires, where we have the Free Womb Act, which is very much a gradual abolition that was pushed forward, ultimately all babies that are born to enslaved mothers are able to become free. Yes, that was enacted in Cordoba, but the contested freedom cases that I thought I would have found were not there. Why? And this is important for us to consider, and that is that Cordoba remained a very conservative, small city. And so acts of liberalism and or any would not be a successful act of resistance and or an attempt to gain social mobility. Instead, these mothers, 
looked for and used through the defender of the poor um, these, this very old law that ultimately acknowledged that indigenous peoples were always free. The labor, the social conditions, very, very similar to those that were enslaved. In fact, they worked alongside each other all the time, but they were always going to be considered free. And so what we see through these process of any of contested freedoms is that Again, ultimately, I don't deserve to be enslaved if I'm threatened with it because I've always been indigenous. And not only have I always been indigenous, but I can prove it through my maternal side because as long as your mother is free, again, borrowing from a 13th century law that was still quite active in the 19th century in Cordoba, as long as your mother is free, you're free. And I think that's important as we start to move into understandings again of whiteness and citizenship as it starts to evolve, especially during the wars of independence and this breaking away of the Spanish so-called tyranny that existed and thinking more and more about how essentially blackness and or indigeneity becomes then a conversation piece into this growing notion of of a republic. And so ultimately, through various cases that I read, I found that that is what they did. Oops. Um, Maria Guerra was an amazing case that I found in Cordoba starting in 1809, in which she argued that ultimately she was indigenous. Why? Her, as she would argue, her patron, her patron had died and his children now were trying to sell her. I would say out of desperation, but definitely quite savvy and very strategic. She went to the defender of the poor, which represents all marginalized peoples. And this was not unique to Argentina. That was throughout the, um, throughout Spanish America. And she ultimately put forward her case, which was that she had always served in the house. Her mother had served in the same house. Her grandmother had as well, but they were always free Pampa Indians, Christianized and loyal servants, but always free. Now, of course, those that wanted to sell her to make a profit, and we have to consider, you know, the 19th, early 19th century during the wars of independence, it's, it's you know, money is very scarce and hard to come about. Come about. There's an opportunity to gain some money. They, the, the children of her former patron would argue, however, no. She was known for being the La Conga, and she ultimately is a black slave. And you go back and forth countering. And ultimately she said, I wear mantas. I have a brother-in-law who is a cacique who you know, lives in La Toma, an, an area that was very close to the city, a pueblo that was very close to the city. And she provided all these different old ideologies and of, of what would be identity markers for being Indian at the, um, end of the 18th century, early 19th century. Again, she won. And she was able to win by 1817, so nine years, no, eight years, sorry, <laughs> eight years of litigation, mainly stopping and going because of the war. And because she then was able to prove that she was not a slave, but a free Indian, she also was able to acquire um, uh, freedom for her children, as well as her grandchildren, because freedom, again, passes through the maternal, through the maternal line. So recognizing then ultimately that Cordoba in many ways was seeing then citizenship and the new beginnings of the Republic as a free Republic. We also have to consider, however, the tactics to become free were not going to be the same as Buenos Aires. And that's important for us to think about ways in which people resist. 
It is always based off of the context upon which they're operating in. And I stress this to, again, really force this notion that blackness as well as whiteness or being indigenous is not monolithic. Even within the same country, you have to consider the social, economic, and political context upon which they're operating. And then what I wanna stress also for the Republican period, and this is important for us too, is the way that citizenship started to truly be defined and used and thought about in terms of who would belong and how they would belong. And so what I'm seeing in, in gendered aspect is how daughters became the vehicle to uplift the next generation, how they would be a part of that process that would ultimately lead to what I would define as institutionalized whitening and the modernization period that we're mo more familiar with. Ultimately, what they are providing as daughters are a vehicle known as, or not a vehicle, but a terminology known as becoming Republican mothers. Um, Republican motherhood is something that US historians are very well familiar with in terms of the participation in the new, in the new Republic, excuse me, as ultimately um, being loyal, somewhat citizens. I say somewhat because they legally cannot be citizens, but this is how they participate. And that as future mothers, they would raise future sons to be loyal, um, rid, ridding them of various levels of moral ignorance, as well as um, encouraging various levels of work ethics, work ethic, excuse me. But in order to do that, that meant that they had to go to school. And so in Cordoba, one of the very unique aspects about this place was that that was not something that just came out of the blue during the Republican period. In fact, it, it was the late 18th century in which a school for girls was created by San Alberto. And this school for girls ultimately was for orphans. And specifically they wanted to target Spanish orphans, but they allowed for a certain number of indigenous and, and, and black girls to attend. Um, but they oftentimes were, I would argue, in many ways, in subservient roles. Um, they could, quote unquote, get some education, but uh, I haven't found too much evidence in, in regards to that. But then in 1811, during the Wars of Independence, they decided to create an entire new class for Parda girls. Now, Parda almost like mestiza that I spoke about before. Parda was an interesting terminology that was starting to become a catch-all phrase. And a catch-all phrase for all those that were not considered to be Española or by the 1820s to be ultimately a, um, what was I gonna say, be a, um, be Spanish because that was considered to be a, uh, dirty word, right? So instead the census data would start to describe them as being blanco or noble. So it was interesting to see it already being sprinkled by the 1811 because by 1832, literally half the population was either pardo or blanco. So in the school, they invited only three um, African descended girls as well as indigenous girls but then group them all within this terminology of part of girls. And they were part of a generation that would uplift, that needed uplifting in order to ultimately become the ultimate mother for the next generation. And so I found an interesting case with Bernardina in 1816 in which her freedom was tied to going to that school. The manumission that ultimately was granted to her from her former owner was based off of her going to that school and finishing it. The school, as I mentioned, existed from 1811, or not school, the, the class existed from 1811 to 1853, and it was a segregated class. One in which, again, 
pretty much all girls who are not white could attend in order to become the ideal mother and be participate in what would become this institutionalized whitening process. An institutionalized whitening process, as I start to wrap up, that would ultimately solidify at the end of the 19th century into a, homogene a homogeneous notion of whiteness. A whiteness that at least ideologically speaking could not be procured from what was on the inside, but instead had to be um, formulated from the outside. And so we see then this call for immigration in order to move forward with the modernization process. But I want us to stop and instead start with, instead of starting there, look at how already the grooming of whitening was taking place already before the end of the 19th century. And so we can say then in some way, shape or form that yes, Immigration definitely changed the demography of Argentina, but the whitening process had already long begun. And it's by looking at specifically the interior and seeing these smaller towns and or cities such as Córdoba and recognizing that is more of the norm than let's say Buenos Aires, which is very much the exception, that we will start to get a more comprehensive understanding of what is whitening in Argentina. Thank you. Very interesting, Eric. I'm, I wrote down a lot of, I mean, uh, yeah, names and really oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and I realized yes. I didn't. I didn't stop. Like I thought it was like yes. I guess it's on a roll. So I apologize. It's okay. Uh, I think we, we open for questions, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, both from the Zoom and YouTube. It's a, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much, Erika. Uh, I think before the questions, even we, we can clap you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then we can open to comments, questions, and anything you need. Well, I want to start from here. Is it okay? Uh, Erica, uh, I have studied um, colonial period with the Jesuits, as you said, you, you know it very much. And I found that during 18th century, in colonial period, there was a flexibility in terms of uh, racial categories in in Argentina, in colonial Argentina. Sometimes the same person appear as a pardo, appear as a, as a mulatto, and it was the same person, and it was not sometimes he or she behind the justice, but it, there were the witnesses that consider him or her in a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it's not somebody trying to appear behind the justice uh, in a better way than, 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 than he can. But, but it, it was seen by the others uh, in different ways. Uh, what can you say about that? Well, I think what we are reflecting on is, um, well, first it, it would depend on the document, right? And I think if you're looking specifically at court cases in which witnesses were bound, the question would be then what motive do they have to define this person as being mulatto or pardo or espanol. But ultimately what we're seeing in these witness accounts is that um, even though someone else, like I mentioned, even if they were trying to put forth the notion that they were um, espanola, at the end of the day, your identity is dependent on how others see you. And so that is why I think what, what more than anything it shows is why witness accounts were seen, seen as and used as valid uh, evidence. 
in terms of defining who you are and what you represent. And we know that, you know, some witnesses obviously had, you know, agendas. And so to claim in some ways that, you know, someone who says that they are part of in one, one, you know, avenue or, or context, and then someone else to say, no, you're this mulatto, I would just, you know, we'd have to really get into the context of the case to understand why they would potentially want to do that. But I I guess what I just want to stress again, it just really shows that, you know, your the way that you are defined is based off of other people's perceptions of you. And that's very powerful for our understandings of how whiteness can be cracked and as well as how it can be maintained. It all depends. And then I would ask, you know, who are these witnesses and what are they relate? What how are they related to the defendant and or, um, you know, the prosecutor or not the prosecutor, but the person who's, who's um, putting forth the, the case. So all that comes to being and comes to play, but it's such an interesting aspect about witness accounts and why they were, you know, levels of, of true evidence. Thank you very much, Erica. So we have messages uh, from Daniela Carrizo, muy interesante, Sabrina Herrero, how interesting, thank you very much. Aime Rojas Petruccelli, uh, talk is so interesting. Uh, Flo Lauria, thank you. Sabrina Ferrero, how interesting. Thank you very much. Felipe Araujo, outstanding. Oh, Matias Vichalva, <laughs> thank you, amazing. Elena Pirelón, excelente, gracias. Milagros Marto, thank you. María José Monge, very interesting, thank you. Lucía Zavala, thank you very much. Victoria Rochitelli, thank you. Silvana Fernandez, thank you. Sofia Matassa, that was amazing. Oh. Aime Rojas, uh, okay, uh, thank you so much from Sofia Matassa. Homero Lanzavecchia, thank you. Uh, this was very interesting, said Ariana Segal. Guido Miller, Guido Mueller, thank you. Uh, Oriana Neri, so interesting, thank you so much. Graciela Baum, I celebrate this amazing talk. Giordano. Oh. J.F. Giordano, thank you. Juan Schneider, thank you so much. Lucio Fabre, thank you, amazing. Uh, Ariel Ferreira, Angie Claros. Um, I, we have a question from Homero Lanzavecchia. Yay! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sir, did black women have legal knowledge about witnesses' law? Where did they get it from? That's what Omero said. Okay. Well, hi, Omero. Thank you for the question. Um, what we know is obviously um, we can't get into the mindset of, of, of the knowledge that they had, um, but we can, as historians recognize, that they did have access to legal aid. And I think that's something else we need to stress about why it is a privilege to study the urban sphere in the cities, because that's where you're going to find, and that's where they were able to find what are known as defenders of the poor, which are court appointed, ultimately, uh, what we would say, you know, public defenders today, they actually had that. Um, and that was something that was adopted from the Spanish um, system, legal system that was brought forward to the Americas and was used, this particular person was used for all what they would define as marginalized peoples, whether it be women, divorced women, impoverished women, indigenous peoples, African descendants, both free and enslaved. And of course, they even had one for children. And so the issue that we're starting to look into more and more is how good certain defenders Defensores de los Pobres existed because we're starting to get into some similar names with successful cases versus those that were not so successful. So that's another avenue um, in which a legal history is headed to really look at what they're, they're doing. But the access to and the knowledge of 
who would best represent them is something that I'm finding very interesting. And in fact, I had one case in which she found that the defender of the poor wasn't doing good enough. And so she went to the court to ask for somebody else. So there is that negotiation and strategy that is being put forth by Black women. Maybe not so much the actual, obviously, the precedents that had existed since the 13th century or the 16th century. I doubt that they may have known that, but they at least knew who to go to to get it done. Thank you, Erica, for your answer. So we have Rocio Miranda, muchísimas gracias. Albertina Seri, excelente presentación, felicitaciones. Saludos desde Berlín, from Berlin. Camila Yanez, thank you very much. We, we have another question from Sofia Matassa. There are any articles you recommend about understanding racial identity identities uh, currently today today yeah there's a few people that have been doing um i'm uh, they're referring to the 20th century 21st century i think there are some really good argentine scholars as well as u.s scholars that do argentine history that are, are coming up with some good stuff most recently i would think i think it's called um it's the anthology by elena um, I can't, oh, no, Paulina, Paulina Alberto and, and Eduardo Elena. Um, and I believe it's called Rethinking Race in the 20th Century. And that has about 15 different chapters about racial identities today in Argentina. Most recently, of course, the most cutting edge um, um, aspect is about Asian identities in Argentina, which is so understudied, but hopefully there'll be more of a push for that in the next few years. So that has really been coming forth. Ezekiel Adamowski has also written quite extensively about um, racial identities and is specifically this interrogation of the word negro, which is also very interesting. One in which, of course, is very much um, a, 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 a nickname for endearment as well, you know, mi negri, and then one that can be very much uh, an insult. <laughs> and unfortunately, can maybe apply to the same person, depending on the context. So you have these kind of situations that are, are coming forth. And I really definitely sociologists are putting, putting forth a lot of good stuff. Um, I forget his last name, but this guy named Ignacio, he just wrote a book called The Darkening Nation, which is actually interrogating the 21st century and this question of potentially uh, the darkening aspect or this um, excel not so much celebration, but the visualization of blackness, indigeneity um, coming forward in Argentina. So that's that's very new as well. Yes, thank you, Anna. Yes. Thank you, Erika. So we have Martina Agostegis. Thank you. Camila Valdivia. Thank you so much. And we have another question from uh, Natalia Eva. Thanks for your research. I want you to ask, how do you think the religious missions in Cordoba influence the rationalization process? So that's a great question. And I... Um, and it's still that what makes, uh, I believe, Cordoba quite unique than the rest of um, Argentina is the strength of the Jesuit presence. Um, most importantly, of course, it's the education. It's the university from 1613 onward, uh, the urban presence, as well as the various ranches that surrounded the city. And what I think they were able to ultimately push forward were two things. One was a, a conversation that is still lacking about Black and Indigenous relations and ultimately how they interacted. Oftentimes what Jesuits were noted to do were to try and create an antagonistic relationship between the two in order for them to ultimately so Jesuits did not feel that there was a level or a threat of an alliance coming together. Um, so I think that's something that still needs to be defined and discussed a bit more. But also the question of free versus enslaved identities and the mixture within that. So a great case, story, uh, case study that I have is a man named Jose Escanibi, 
I'm probably saying that wrong. I'm sorry, but his first name is definitely Jose. And it was a, he was a, um, again, a very, it was a contested freedom court case for the church in which he ultimately argued that um, he was somewhat, again, someone came forward to purchase him and he said, no, I can't be purchased. I've always been free. And they said, what do you mean? You work for the church. And he said, yes, but I've always been free. I am an indigenous person, right? And again, going to the defender of the poor and proving that he was indigenous was a very interesting tactic. And that's seen within the jurisdiction of the church. So you see this constantly being played out in terms of manifestations of free versus enslaved, and but also then the solidification that if you're enslaved, you must be black. So there's something to be said about that legacy as well. Um, the other thing too, for the Jesuits, I do want to stress, I think, was their ability to create, create and maintain levels of familial social networking pro uh, um, processes. Um, when they were eventually kicked out of uh, the Indies, one of the um, <clears throat> last remaining pieces of evidence that we have for the slaves is that when they went to go to market to sell, they would list them all by family. So that is something to at least potentially suggest that there is a level of respect for attempting to maintain the familial network, which as we know, was pivotal in the manumission process. Thank you, Erika. Uh, so we have um, Jasmine here. I did, I did not understand the concept of calidad very mm. well. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, I can. So Calidad, and thank you for the great question. So Calidad, um, <clears throat> if we were to think about it today, many would argue that that would be something that we would see as equivalent to race or racial identity. But Calidad, especially for the colonial period, was ultimately who or how or what defines your quality of being literally Kali, that the quality of who you are. And it was various factors that came into being. So what was your job, for example? Who is your family, your family ties? Levels of limpieza de sangre, meaning are you, you know, to what extent are you considered to be a Catholic, to be Espanola, Espanol or Peninsular? Um, are you born in the Americas? Um, also, your reputation, how you were viewed as in terms of being honorable, virtuous, or not so honorable, or not so virtuous, all these factors came together to define you, okay? And so that's why we say that's the quality of who you are, the calidad. Now, what we're discovering is that with that calidad, there were certain labels attached to all of those components together. So you would have, for example, if you were considered or defined as being Espanol, you were to have the qualities of being, um, having limpies de sangre, being Catholic, being either born in the peninsula or first generation Ameri American, um, Americano or Criollo, that you um, were educated that you ultimately had property, that you had wealth, all that came together to define you as being Espanol. Similarly, when it comes to being Negro, right? Even though the label, the label suggests ultimate color, it's these various factors that are also coming into play. Again, your status, are you enslaved? Maybe you're free, but are you enslaved? Where do you live? Do you have access to education? Do you have access to a so-called free job? Do you have property? And all these answers are no, 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 and no, but yes to being enslaved, that would help define you as being a Negro because you are again viewed by others as not having various attributes to give you a certain quality. And similarly for indigenous peoples as well. And then over time, because of the mixture, you would have different than names like Mestizo, Zambo, Mulatto, 
people that would come forward to try and again, put you on a scale of quality in order to determine the, mo- the ultimate privilege and status, which was to be an Espanol or the most disadvantaged, which was to be a Negro and especially in the Argentine context. So it's all these coming together to allow for then what I was arguing levels of fluidity. Because for example, if you were as Bernabella, the color of a, of a, of a, a Spanish woman, meaning very light skinned, um, and then potentially had some property and you could dress a certain way, you could easily become this Española. So that's what I mean by making sure that we recognize that it is more, it's about these fluidities and how you are viewed by others. Your reputation is ultimately what defines you. Mary, you're getting a lot of attention. We have (laughs) dozens of questions. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Andresa Marisha. We could also mention the influence of caudillos, caudillos. It mm-hmm. is said in Ariel de la Fuente text, Facundo mm-hmm. and Chacho in Song and Stories, that Facundo forced a white lady to marry with Facundo's servant after she mocked him. Mm-hmm. What can you say about that? So I haven't read that specific case from Ariel, who is a friend of mine. So Ariel, I'm sorry. But I can speak a bit about Kalishos and race relations. So I thank you for that, Um, especially for Cordoba. Um, And one thing I want to stress is it doesn't matter if it was left-leaning or right-leaning, federal or unitarian. Clearly, the idea was how to use, you know, people of color, Black bodies to their advantage. It was definitely a political project. And so, for example, um, you see, you know, Jose Maria, Jose Maria Paz desegregates, right, public schools for African descendants. He, and he puts forth this kind of manifesto that says from henceforth in 1832, all kids will go to school. They'll have the same teachers and all the stuff that comes forward. But um, that's not for any uh Negros that are federales, right? That part is like, you know, quiet as it's kept. And so you see that it's only to a certain extent that that comes forward. Um, He will go to bat for just those that are in his militia. And he will actually, he will make sure when, when a black soldier comes forward and says, you know, my white fiance's parents don't, won't allow me to marry her because she's white. Um, he, you know, sides with his black soldier. But again, it's only because it's his soldier. It's not a larger movement of black unity or, or black um, upliftment. Because then a few years later, a federal, so the opposing side, uh, Benito Otero, then um, desegregates the university, which was profound when you think about it. And again, it's part of that political project that they're using these black bodies to, to ultimately gain allegiance and, and, and um, basically people that will be able to defend their political project. And we see the complete opposite, you know, for um, Rosas, as they would say, in Buenos Aires. So you have Jose Maria Paz, who has the loyalty of black people, and he's a Unitarian. And then you have um, Rosas in uh, Buenos Aires, who has the um, allegiance of Blacks there. So it's, it's interesting to think about these political projects and, again, their use of Black bodies, both physically in terms of being, you know, out there ready to fight, but also, as we know, at the end of the 19th century, because immigrants were not citizens, they needed them at the ballot box as well. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Horacio Mulali, awesome talk. Thank you. Graciela Baum, how can we tell the racial, racialized spectrum as an open category applied on enslaved Black women did not respond to an already whitening strategy of appropriation? How can we tell the racial, racialized spectrum as an open category applied on enslaved Black women did not respond to an 
an already widening strategy of appropriation? I am not quite understanding. How can we tell the racialized spectrum as an open category applied on enslaved black women did not respond to an already widening strategy of appropriation? Oh, so I'm not, but they're appropriating what? Is it from black women? That's, I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't know what you mean by the appropriation aspect. Okay, Graciela Baum, if you can clarify your question. Please. Okay, okay, we, we are going to another and then we, we can come back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question, but please clarify, please. Okay, Andrew, Andrew Acosta. That was so interesting. I remember being confused about using the word negro in a friendly way to call my own friends. A few years ago, when a famous influencer started to complain about how we use. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a very interesting comment from Andrew. Uh, Andrew Acosta again, terms that we are not supposed to use. Now I understand it better. Thanks. Andrew, Andrew Acosta, the same guy again. Uh, okay, uh, same thing. Jasmine, thank you very much, Erika. Daniela Carrizo, it is very interesting, all this information. Daniela Carrizo, you are all amazing. Okay, and that was the last one. Okay. So I will, I'll speak a little bit more about that because I think it's important, especially in, um, in terms of the 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 nomenclature used to describe people in Argentina. And I think also as someone who was, or is an outsider and a visitor. And um, so I always have to be delicate about that um, because I don't ever want to come across as that shanky over there who is, you know, coming forward with way too much, you know, I respect that this is not my history. And, um, but if there is something to be said about, the use of the word negro and how it's being applied and when it's being applied. And I especially found it quite interesting when you think of the legacy of it. And I want to talk a little bit more, you know, thinking about well, what do we mean when we're referring to someone who has blonde hair, blue eyed as negro, which people will tell me, Ari, that's what I mean. You know, not, it's not racial. It's not that it's not for black people. You know, anyone can be a Negro. Anyone can have, you know, um, anyone can be, a, you know, from the Visha and be a Negro and blonde hair, blue eyes and, you know, this dark soul kind of thing. That would, that's the type of stuff that would be, you know, explained away. But really what they're pointing to and or looking at when it comes to people that, you know, uh, have the appearance of even people like Maradona or these Morochos is this legacy of, of blackness in this country and how it has been, as I was describing this level of marginalization, of being uneducated, of being impoverished, that has persisted. And even though it's shifted now more to a class conversation, that is ultimately the legacy, right, and the consequences of this racialization process is that you can divorce Blackness from the race, so to speak, and even though it may seem neutral, really what you're doing is continuously continuing to perpetuate a very harmful ideology, right? And that is that you are marginalized, uneducated, um, criminalized at times person that doesn't belong. And that's the harm of it. And so even when I was there and now, you know, seeing and why people did not want to call me Negra, right, was because they're saying you're not those stereotypes. And yet I'm saying to myself from a U.S. perspective, no, being Black is something to be proud of. And so it's, it's quite interesting to kind of juxtapose the two um, and and to, to see these legacies in this conversation continuously continuing to happen. And it's so haphazard, it's so common in the conversation piece that it really shows that Black invisibility has really um, succeeded in many ways in, in Argentina. Eric, are you still following Argentine soccer? Not recently, but what, what, what recently happened? 
there's um, in one of the two teams in, in La Plata, uh, there's a player, an Afro-Colombian, Carbonero, and his coach always referred to him as a Negrito. Yeah. Publicly. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Negrito Carbonero is playing very, very well today. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, this is still a way of, of referring. I, I, he, he's doing that, that uh, publicly. Yeah, and, and, and even I, you know, over time with my friends, we refer to as La Negri or Mi Negra. And so I'm not, I'm acknowledging that there is this conversation. And as I mentioned, the same word, as I said, can be one of compute, complete, you know, loving and enduring, you know, understanding than is El Negro de la Familia. You hear that constantly, but then that it can shift so quickly. And so I, even with that enduring notion of being La Negra, I think that also really sets the tone to questions of, you know, how they're viewed for uplifting processes in the family and what, you know, this kind of um, loving but servile position, I think, is also there as well. It's, it's interesting. And I have to acknowledge, you know, Argentina is moving towards a level of racial reckoning. I mean, this removal, or at least the attempt or claims to remove um, the Blanca floor, uh, right, and, and try and replace with white hands or, you know, white looking hands, are attempts to acknowledge that those um, stereotypes are harmful. Um, so there is, you know, a movement towards, you know, moving beyond these, similar to the United States with, you um, the Aunt Jemima, this is a good thing, uh, but you can definitely still hear in the vernacular that this there's a process. There's still a long way to go. Okay, Ari, and I think this is the we have the last question. Uh, first, Sofia Matassa, thank you so much, and Ariadna Siegel or Segal. An article for the BBC stated that during the past census a lot less people than it be expected identify themselves uh, as Afro-descendants. Do you think this has to do with not knowing their roots? Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's part of probably the most, most is, is that people just don't know because it was such a successful move towards the end of the, the, the 19th century, early 20th century to not be black. To be black was to be completely disadvantaged. So why would you claim that? There's, you know, very few that would argue that black consciousness existed. You see it a little bit in the black um, newspapers, but no, it's definitely, definitely a different uh, conversation. You know, is completely silence, if anything. Um, so I do believe the majority do not know that they are. Um, especially now that it's becoming in fashion in some way, shape, or form to acknowledge your Blackness, um, especially for these younger generations and the third and fourth generation Afro-Argentine that now exist in Argentina, they're not hiding anymore. They are very much proud of being, you know, um, sons and daughters of various immigrants and that's just, and they're just as Argentine. And so that also is promoting others to, you know, shake in many ways their family tree and be like, ah, I guess we may have had some and did not know. So I do think though the majority, just someone in the family just stopped talking about it and, you know, kind of went silent, easily done in this country where if being black is at a disadvantage, why would you promote it? And so, yeah, definitely. And well, th this is the very last, okay? okay. Last but not least, okay. Uh, Soledad Cornu, would you say that Argentinian society throughout history has been more open minded, accepted more Black women than American society? Personal values, the education, manners, more than color of, of skin. In fact, that helped to make a more peaceful coexistence in the community. So would you say that Argentinian society throughout history has been more open-minded than American society regarding Black women? No, I wouldn't. I would say that um, 
the way that Black women have been treated in both places are indicative of the social economic conditions in which they took place. To have to deny your existence in order to feel that that's the only way to succeed and or have a better life for your family is not, I would believe, an easy decision and one that many, you know, to, to, to have to really look to deny that side of who you are is, is not something I would say as being a peaceful transition or ability to, to live out a happy life. Um, in fact, I think that um, in its own way is a form of violence that, you know, I, I think that needs to be interrogated more. Now, in terms of um, the ways in which um, possibly, and, and I'll admit this, the ways in which you see more of it being more blatant in the United States because of the laws that were put out there, we also have to turn it around and see the success stories also that existed as well. And I feel like because there is such a difference, and of course, Jorge and Marcelo are going to get into that later on, that you can see, you know, the, the laws being so blatant and in, in your face in the United States, I think oftentimes, and we don't see that in Argentina, we think, well, Argentina must have been a paradise. And we can't think that way. Because if you have to ultimately exist and, and thinking of even Afro-Argentines today that have to constantly say, I am just as Argentine as you, think of how tiring and insulting that is when your own country denies your existence. And that to me is a part of that legacy, a, a hard decision that Afro descendants and African descended women had to make years ago, but the legacy of their willingness to ultimately let go of their racial identities is that now those that are of their descendants can't even claim Argentina as, as a society because it's still so much entrenched that Argentina does not have any black people. So how does that do for your participation as a citizen? What does that do for your participation in terms of feeling that you belong in a country that denies that you ever existed? So I say that, of course, the U.S. has its issues. We're not, I don't need to go into that as well, but I think we just have to be careful in, in saying one must be better than the other instead of realizing what does that mean to navigate in two very distinct and interesting social, uh, political, and cultural environments and contexts. Okay. I think we can finish your, your talk with this thing that, uh, make us think about our own identity here for Argentinians. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I will ask you all to open the microphones to a big uh, applause for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you for really this. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Br brilliant presentation, Dr. Erika Eduardo. Really leave us thinking. So mm -hmm. it's a sign that it was really great. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. And if anything, that's what I want. It's just, just think about the use of language, how we yeah. use it, you know, be more active and less passive when we're using terminology yes. and um, what it potentially implies, even if we are, so that we're not complicit in perpetuating potentially harmful ideologies and stereotypes. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Again, Thank, you. Uh, Thank you, Jorge. Thank, Thank you a lot. Thank you, Jorge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we, we are having on next Thursday, uh, May the 19th, um, our next talk, Building and Tearing Down Statues, Comparing Historical Representation of Christopher Columbus in U.S. and in Argentina. Uh, that's going to be next Thursday, the 19th. So we hope we, uh, we will be able to be all there. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Erica, again. Thanks. Bye, Yuri. Bye. Bye, Ceci. Bye, Anna. Bye, Fernando. Bye. Bye, bye. bye, -bye. Ciao.